Oh yeah. Also, I gotta, man, I gotta say thank you to David Whitehead and Michael Tessarian and the Unslave podcast because they're the ones who brought it back to me, or well, I found it on through them, and they brought it back in, around and they put it into a digestible form where I could understand it. They kind of articulate it in ways that really made sense to me, and so now I'm I'm inspired to get into it. So I started reading just some of it. So you can also find a lot more of this information on the Unslave podcast. And there's also, there's quite a few videos out there. Too. I'll, I'll try to link them down below. This is going to be a reading of what is said to be the oldest story in the world. Now, I know that is a tall claim, a big claim. And it may not actually be the oldest story in the world, but it is a very important one. And it's probably one of the oldest stories in the last 12,000 years. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty uh, sure of that. It's called the Box Saga. Saga... Sa means to give, and ga means to get in this ancient language. So saga is to give and to get. Now, I'm bringing this out, and I have to give credit to other people who have brought it to my attention. I'm definitely not the first to discover this, of course, but I feel like I think people need to hear it. And I'm only going to be touching on it, just a few, a few concepts in the beginning of the book. It's a, actually, it's a really, really big and profound story that comes out of the North Pole. It actually comes out of Finland and that area known as Scandinavia. Now, I first ran across the, the box saga when I was studying the heathens. And I have to go back and look who I was, what, what videos I was looking at. There was an older gentleman teaching about the heathen and heathendom. And it was really interesting to me. And somewhere along the line, I ran across this thing called the Bach Saga. And I touched on it and kind of went, went into it. And it was just, at the time, I don't think I was ready for it. It was over my head a bit. But then it's come back to me. It's come back around a couple times. I realized I watched and listened to a few lecturers talk about it. And I knew there was something special about it, but I just didn't quite know what it was. And now, now I do. Now I've studied a lot of etymology and language um, and symbol literacy and how our alphabet came into its form in the quote-unquote Western world. And when you study the esoteric structure of the alphabet and also symbols and their nature, you start to really dive deep into what language is, how it came to be abstracted, how it came to be into our world, how we use it, how it's started in the mind and now it's everywhere outside of us. It's on every wall. It's in, it's everywhere. Language printed and we interact with it. We're the only creature on the planet that does that, that abstracts their language, puts it into form and then takes it outside of themselves, and then reflects upon it. So, language is very, very powerful. And this book really opens up the idea of the first languages of humans. And um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it is definitely one of the first, one of the oldest. And... Well, it's hard to explain how I, how I know that, but you have to spend a lot of time in etymology to kind of see those connections. Anyway, I'm going to be reading just some of it, and I'm hoping that people will, will be inspired to look into it themselves because it's an old, 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 old story that really has very profound implications for our real history, human history, 
and also for our future. A lot of this information was hidden because it was systematically suppressed, stomped out, made illegal. And so it's been hidden in oral tradition for for a very long time. I would say for 10,000 years around that amount of time. Okay, so I'm going to read most of it, and I might just pause like I normally do and kind of like um, ruminate on some of the ideas if I find them interesting and think that, that, that I could add something to them. If not, I'm just going to read. The Box Saga, B-O-C-K. This story is first and foremost about heathendom. Before there was any form of religion on our planet, people were guided by mythological beliefs. In a similar vein to all heathen mythology, the Bach saga hinges on the powers of nature. The first power, that of Hel, H-E-L, and forms the center of the Odinma, or Udinma. It is the old North Pole before the Earth's axis shifted. The root language, Hel, H-E-L, means clear or light, as well as whole or complete. And since it is the center of Udinma, Hell, O, means hello. Okay, so there I have to start right now just doing little asides. You have to really study etymology to, to rethink the meanings of the words that you use today um, because they've been changed many times. Some of the, the roots are still there, but the meanings have shifted. They've been um, appropriated, co-opted, propagandized, talismanized, many, many, many of them. So everybody thinks of the word hell as being this dark, negative inferno of fire because of the Roman Catholic view of, and use of that term. But I'm here to tell you, and, it, it, and anybody that studied heathendom or Norse mythology or, or Druidic mythology or the Brehon Law or Scandinavian mythology or just European, Germanic, Dutch, um, Russian you'll find that, that the word hell was not this dark, um, devilish place. So you have to, you're going to, when, when I go through this here, there's going to be a lot of words that you're going to have to rethink what they mean, um, even though you may think something different today. So hopefully you can kind of keep an open mind while listening to this. But hell was a, was a good thing. It was a beautiful place. It was the North Pole, the actual North Pole, true north, before the first Ragnarok. And Ragnarok is a term that means something like um, catastrophe. So there was some sort of catastrophe in this story that moved the planet, made it wobble, shift, twist. And so the North Pole is no longer actually aligned to the pole star, Polaris, or, the, or what we call Ursa Major, in the sky, the dome of heaven, the place in the sky where the stars do not set ever at night. It is actually north. It's somehow our universe knows that there's an up and a down, and it's orientated all the everything in it according to that. That's why planets don't, you know, w w spin aimlessly. They spin with a top and they spin with a bottom. So the North Pole has shifted from where it originally was to 23.4 degrees in a new place. So you have to you have to think about that. That's the first Ragnarok and so that was a catastrophe and that changed the story and that changed the people that held this story and they they documented that time in their in their lives, in their saga, in their spirituality. So the term Udinma is where we get the term Odin, the precursor of, of God the Father in many, many, many religious traditions. He's also the one-eyed God who hung upside down on a sacred tree to gain the knowledge and wisdom of the world. Odin Ma is a ring. It's a, it's a, a circle around the North Pole that was in a paradisical 
state or climate at the time. It was a sacred place. Okay, so I'll, <laughs> I'll keep going. The symbol that corresponds to hell is a hooked cross or the swastika. Considered the wheel of life, the word swastika is derived from svavlstikan or sulfur stick in English. Okay, there's another one. Obviously, people are scared of that term, swastika, but really what it originally was was a sulfur stick, and it referred to a hooked cross, which is really just the spin of the earth when you're at the North Pole and you can see the shadow of the pole move in a circle in the same direction always. And they drew these little hooks on it as a symbol which represents the sun and the motion of the cosmos. And that's funny, you know, if you go all over East, go over Asia, go to, you know, go to India, Thailand, you know, the Buddhist nations, the even the Russian in Russia, the swastika is all over the place there, and it has no reference whatsoever to this modern this modern thing that that we call Hitler. It has nothing to do with that at all. So that is how a word or a symbol can be changed and be um, perverted. So it's a very ancient symbol. It's all over the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata. It's in their text as a very sacred and spiritual symbol. Okay, heathen people used to make a pole from the trunk of a palm tree with the four spokes extending from the top. Around this, a wooden ring or wheel was then constructed. Attached to the end of the four spokes were model boats filled with sulfur. These were set on fire, which made the wheel turn in the shape of a swastika. This symbolized the earth turning around the sun and the repetition of life from one generation to the next. No doubt, this also made for a great framework display with the heathen people dancing around the pole. Hell got its name from Kliphal, a bedrock formation with a slope on one side and steep incline on the other, a helling in the word Dutch. So Dutch people would still use this word today, helling. This kind of bedrock formation is found in many places around the world. This particular Kiplal, is situated right next to the exact North Pole, located on the island Odin's O, or Odin's U, in front of Helsinki, Finland. The second power is Bach, B-O-C-K. Bach stands for the Bach family. This Bach, whose function is to procreate and keep the wheel of life spinning, represents the sun on Earth. It's a symbol, a symbol in straw, a straw Bach. Still today, Christmas time in Scandinavia, many houses have the bok made of twisted straw as a decoration. The straw symbolized the straller or rays from the sun. The third power is E, which is actually the letter I, you know, I with a dot on top of it, but it's pronounced in the root language as E. The third power is E. The equivalent phonetic pronunciation in English is E. E is the prick of the particular member of the Bach family whose task it is to procreate. The symbol E is a trident. In root language, a tree sul, tree sun, or tree three sun. So trident, that ancient symbol, Poseidon has the trident. It originated as a three-pronged representation of a tree which is powered by the sun a tree sun. It has a prick in the middle and two bock horns on either side. The next power is Udin. Udin is everything. Its symbol is a snake biting its own tail, representing in infinity. It symbolizes the cycle of life always renewing itself. So we've all seen that symbol, the snake biting its own tail. In modern European terms, we call that uh, the, the Euroboros the Euroboros serpent. But as we know, the Euroboros or Ouroboros is seen in the north, the great north, the, the northern lights. So that's how we, that circle for O is the symbol of Udin. It's everything. The fifth power is Ra, R-A, 
Ra is associated with the transportation of energy in all kinds of real and symbolic ways. Ra is symbolized by the moon, reflecting the rays of the sun. It is represented by the first son and first daughter, the king and queen, in the Bach family, who are the caretakers of the human race. Ra's symbol, Ra's symbols, are the rose and the horseshoe, respectively. The sixth power is Tor, T-O-R, pronounced as Tor. Tor is the heart and also a heart friend. Every man and woman had heart friends. Tor's symbol is Tor's hammer. So most people know what, what Tor's hammer or Thor's hammer is. It's a symbol of the heart, but it's also a symbol of the male phallus. It's his hammer. Frey and Freya are the seventh and eighth powers. They were the first two human beings on the planet. The symbol of Frey is the moon, sickle, or mak manskaran, which symbolizes fertility. The symbol of Freya is the harp or the lyra. Frey and Freya were born on the exact north pole in a cistern just next to the klipal. Their parents were an appa, which means a male ape, and a varget, a nanny goat. The nanny goat was impregnated by the appa and produced twins, Frey a boy and Freya a girl. Okay, a little aside here. In all mythology, there's symbolic meaning. And so they write in here that, that mankind was first born from this cross of an ape and a goat. And somehow humans came out of that. Now, personally, I do not believe that. However, I don't know what they mean by that. So I don't know if they mean literally that's what happened or if there's some nuanced meaning to those those animals and their symbolic meaning and how humans come from there. So as you read the box saga, you may run into things that seem bizarre or seem strange and just go, huh? But you just have to keep your mind open because as you read further on, you'll find that some of these things come into light and they start to make sense. As Frey's mother was a nanny goat, he became the first Bach. Frey and Freya grew up drinking their mother's milk. At the age of seven, Frey's sperm started to develop in his testicles, and in the same way every boy still ex experiences today. With this, the sound of his voice also changed. He discovered that... He understood that within his nature was an alphabet, the Alfarnas Bet, or known as the Rhyme of the Allfather. This alphabet is made up of sounds, each with a meaning and a mark. From the combination of these sounds stemmed the root language, the root of all languages. After he transferred the language to his sister, they could speak to each other in this anatomical and natural language. Anatomical and natural in the sense that the sounds primarily refer to Frey and Freya's body parts and secondarily to objects around them. After this, the same sounds refer to more abstract concepts. Okay. All of the sounds that we make, all the tones that the human body can make, are sounds that we hear in nature, um, and we mimic them. And we originally created these sounds, which eventually became symbols. And in order for us to remember them, we, we associated them with things that we will always have with us, which is our body. So these original sounds come out of nature and are in reference to different body parts or different different functions or things the body does. That way we carry the alphabet symbols with us always. And believe it or not, it's the same with numbers. The numbers came from our hands, the fingers, that sort of thing. And this is very interesting because when you study other stories of alphabets and how they came about, they're almost always associated with some natural event that you can reproduce, which means it's a scientifically created language, or the human body in certain postures, movements, or dances. So this all makes sense is from this perspective. Okay. An example of this word crown is primarily, it, it primarily means the top of the head. However, trees also have crowns and the metal top of the bottle 
is also considered a crown. A king wears a crown which symbolizes that he is a king. In Scandinavia, the local Danish and Swedish currencies are also called krone, or crowns, in which the value is again another level of abstraction. When Frey got this revelation of the root language, it contained a plan and destiny for the continuation of the human race on the planet. The language revealed to him how to multiply himself with Freya within a selective system and thereby spread out and fill the planet with people. When Frey became 27 years of age, he started having children with his sister. The first two human beings were thus born on the exact North Pole and began to fulfill the plan contained within the root language, a ramsa or a rhyme. Okay, so some people think it's strange that, uh, you know, a brother and sister uh, did their thing to start procreation, but it's really not strange in historical terms because when you read things like the Bible, people don't realize this, but the Bible reads as a genealogy. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. And if you go into the beginning, you find that it was the first peoples that had to mate with the first peoples in order to diversify. And, you know, eventually they're mating with cousins and eventually they're mating with, you know, long distance cousins. And then eventually you're really no longer, you know, genetically very close, which sounds terrible, but all, all these ancient scriptures uh, talk about the human family in that way because it appears to be the only way that it could have started. So, there you go. Now this Ramsa, or rhyme, I'm going to read it. And I'll do my best to read it in uh, in this old language, which is closest to like Finnish right now. And of course, I do not know how to speak Finnish, so you just got to bear with me. And then I'll read it in English, what it means. Frefrik Udens Wisdom, Som Gjorde Bakken. Till in Brahmin in Godman, som skap skape de guda manskior, filgior valkrior. Okay, and in English that means Frey got wisdom from the sun, who made the Bach to be a good craftsman and a good man inside himself, who created good people, souls, and Valkyrie. Valkyrie is like an is an angel, it's a type of angel. So the wisdom of of which the first line of the rhyme speaks of is that of 29 sounds in the alphabet of the root language. Okay, so that little rhyme right there is a story, a quick story, an origin story of how wisdom came from the sun and then made us good people and then we created a system to maintain a soul and maintain other good people. That's in the story, but also the, the point here is that the sounds of those words were made of the original root tones. Those sounds eventually became an alphabet, like for the example, the sound U, which we might say is a U, or the sound O, which is an O, or you know, the sound A, ah, which we might say is an O or an, or an A. So when this saga was encased generation by generation orally it is not only a story with wisdom in it but is actually a way in which they hid and hold the alphabet the original symbols of writing are deeply encoded in here the alphabet of the root language meaning and marks the first 22 sounds of the root alphabet are ordered in a circle in addition there are seven more sounds outside the circle each sound has a root association and a symbol in the form of a letter. The first sound, E, pronounced E, is also the last and appears again as the tenth. E is the penis of the Bach. The dot on top symbolizes the sperm that comes out of it. The female form of E means inside or in or inside. The ladies have their E inside themselves. The dot of their E is their sap. Okay, so obviously the, the E is the male phallus, but they're also saying the same equivalent is, is within the female. And the reason why they focus on this is two reasons. One, when you really go back and you really start to look into ancient religion, actually it's pre-religion, but 
They're all fertility religions. They all focus around the most important things in life, which was how to create new life and how to keep it alive and how to sustain it. And then how to teach it to be good and healthy to do this again and again and again and again. So a lot of people don't want to hear that. They don't want to think that their their religious beliefs really stem from uh, survival and fertility and and life around that. But that's why you always see, you know, in India you have the the lingam and the yoni, which is a you know a part of the Shiva cult uh, in Hinduism, or maybe even other cults too. It's all over the place. The lingam and the yoni is the male and the female, you know, put together. And this is really no different. But this is this predates that, as far as I can tell. Also. The E, which is like I said, the let the letter that represents that is an I with a dot on it. They use that not only because the male phallus represents that, but because they were at the North Pole, the the original true North Pole, and in order for them to track the land, map the land, track the land, figure out where they were, the sun shined all around them twenty four hours a day. It never set because the earth had no wobble at that time. So there were shadows that were made by a pole that was put in the North Pole. That's why it's called the North Pole. They put that pole in there and they aligned it with the North Star, Polaris. But there's different names for There's like seven different North Stars, but whatever the original one was, which is where Ursa Major is right now. Those stars never set. So they knew that they could orientate themselves to that and with the shadow they could they could create direction and also ley lines which really eventually became lines of longitude and lines of latitude and that's how mapping began and that's how great seafaring began in the north pole so the north the pole is a representation of the male phallus as well as the actual pole that leads to God, which is just a pole in the ground with the sun during the day on top of it, which makes the letter I, or at night, the actual pole star on top of it, which makes the letter I. So that's why the symbol is so important. The second sound is ah, pronounced as the A in ask. Or so the sound should be A pronounced as A in Ask. A stands for Asur. The Asur were the people born in Udinma, the land on the former, former North Pole where the sun never sets. So the Asur, which he's probably going to go into right now, the Asur is where what we would call like the the parents, the, the first, you know, first noble people, the parents. The, you know, some people would call them the gods. Um, but they were like, the people of wisdom. So Udinma is the Asgard or Asgard, the garden around the axis. The garden of Uden, which now we call Eden. The garden of Uden, guarded by the sun and symbolized by the snake biting its tail. Udinma has a diameter of approximately 250 kilometers. Asinor is the female form of Aser. So the Aser were male. And the Asinur is the female. And I can't help but look at this term Asinur and think, oh yeah, that makes sense. Because it's A-S-Y-N-I-O-R. So Nior means night or dark. And the female is has always been associated with the dark, not because it's like scary or negative, but because it's 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 where all things come from. Everything that's there's way more darkness than there is light. So all the stars, you know, come out of the darkness. So the darkness is this birthing, this nurturing, this, 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 you know, all encompassing thing. So we call it the night. That's why when you have a night mare, mare means Mary or the ocean or female mare. So a nightmare is feminine. So the Asinor is kind of like the God, the God, the goddess which is associated with with the night. Frey and Freya were the first two Asur 
who were to populate the planet according to the plan concealed in the root language. The following chapter deals and details how this plan unfolded. Thank you.